G'day folks and welcome to this report of activities throughout 1863 and 1864. I'm combining uh, the, this report will cover the rest of the game pretty much through it until its, uh, its completion. So something to keep in mind is that uh, the first turn of each year is a winter turn and there are no reinforcements for this turn. So basically whatever these forces have at the end of the last year they continue with just for this first turn. Reinforcements don't arrive until uh, the first spring turn which is basically next turn. In the first action cycle, the Union have uh, have the initiative with three a dice differential of three, so three actions. They spend two out in the east, basically Hunter and Hooker moving together, southern end of the Shenandoah Valley, to consolidate their forces and try to contain uh, Robert E. Lee, who sits in Charlottesville with a uh, weakened force, but still a threat. And they spend another S uh, action out in the West Theater, where Grant uh, attacks Confederate forces and forces their um, withdrawal towards towards Corinth. The Confederates respond, uh, mainly uh, consolidating the forces, entrenchments a bit, uh, not much uh, in terms of operations. The second action cycle, Confederates have the initiative but with just one dice differential, there's one action now in each theatre. In the Trans-Mississippi Theatre, they move um, Van Dorn's cavalry out from Arkansas Post. He's going to move north to try to threaten uh, the Union positions, the Union supply positions out in this, this theatre. In the West Theatre, the Confederates just entrench in Corinth, and out in the East, Lee decides to uh, leave his position in Charlottesville and move out towards Hanover, where he consolidates with a larger army. So now there's two large uh, Confederate armies in this East Theatre, one under Bragg and one under Lee, and then both sort of just sitting south of, uh, of Fredericksburg. The, uh, the Union response to this is to shift Grant out to seize Corinth. So he's got a large army now. He's forced the Confederates to retreat to Corinth. And now he shifts back to the west, to the Mississippi, to capture Memphis. This is pretty important. This has four, uh, four victory points in Memphis. Uh, it's right in the, the Mississippi River. Uh, so it's a good location for the Union to hold. Uh, meanwhile, in the Trans-Mississippi Theatre, Curtis, with no opposition in front of him, moves to seize Springfield, uh, the last remaining Confederate uh, resource hex in Missouri. And out in the east, uh, I think this was just a move by Hunter to consolidate forces with Hooker to build up what we have now here is two large uh, Union armies in the eastern theatre confronting facing off against those two large uh, Confederate armies. In the third action cycle, the Confederates have uh, the initiative. They spend some points on training in the West Theatre. In the Trans-Mississippi Theatre, Van Dorn continues to move north to try to just sort of threaten Curtis, threaten uh, his supply lines, and he's basically sitting right in the middle of Missouri. So we can strike with five movement points at each of those three uh resource sexes in that in this area. Meanwhile over in the east, uh, so some for some time the, the, union, the union had invaded Charleston. Uh, they're threatening a lot of these SPs, these, these objective hexes, resource hex, hexes in the area. Uh, and the Confederates are just kind of shifting their forces around um, and consolidating into a larger army. They had been kind of spread out to try and block these SPs. Now they're starting to build an army to um, confront the, uh, the union forces. In response, Curtis, not really bothered by Van Dorn, he decides to leave a garrison behind in Springfield, leaves one SP behind, 5,000 men, but then he decides to march south into Fayetteville. There's, there's one victory point available down there, so he decides to finally launch his invasion of, of the south, Missouri being a border state, of course. In the Western Theatre, uh, Grant continues his charge, he captures Holly Springs, divides Confederate forces, uh, feeling really uh, confident here and strong with his army, um, no garrison left behind in Memphis, he just controls it and then moves on. So it's one, one movement point to control this space and then he, uh, he moves on. Uh, and in the Eastern Theatre, uh, Sigil takes a, a small force from Couch. Couch remains behind in Charleston. And Sigil decides to move north to try to capture uh, Florence, but he's unsuccessful. And... In the final action cycle, the Union have the initiative again with a differential of one. In the Western Theatre, Sherman takes a force, 
uh, decides to leave that sort of holding position in Bowling Green and tries to isolate Kirby Smith by cutting off his supply. So he begins to move down towards Nashville and attacks uh, Morgan's cavalry unit, which he he wipes out successfully. Now Nashville is a a three victory point city, and they're just leaving Kirby Smith behind in his garrison in Bowling Green. Uh, Rosecrans is still up in the north. McClellan's still up in Henderson. So Sherman decides, well, these guys could hold their own up here in Kentucky. We'll begin to uh, to move south. And uh, yeah, that ends the winter turn. So in the next turn, the uh, reinforcements arrive and the Union has initiative on the first turn. Now in the east, uh, Lee had brought together quite a large force and attacked Fredericksburg. This forced Banks to retreat to, to the north and um, he was, it put the Union in a difficult position. I captured this moment on a separate video, but basically uh, Lee took up a large army uh, and split Banks and Hooker apart. They're now, you know, Hooker is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight movement points, I think, away from Banks. So he's driven a wedge between these two Union armies in the Eastern Theatre. He's left Bragg behind with, I think, just one or two SPs. So he's left his supply uh, line a bit vulnerable, but uh, in Fredericksburg, he's really in the central position to be able to strike in any direction, which really upsets uh, the Union. Uh, Stuart also moves his cavalry north. Now, this is, I think, a bit of a bad, in hindsight, a bad move by the Union. They decide just to move Stoneman north to try to help protect their supply lines. This is their move. Hooker remains down south. I pretty quickly regret this. Uh, meanwhile, further uh, to the south in the Western Theatre, so Grant takes a break. In the meantime, Reynolds moves to seize Pensacola, which he does uh, quite easily. In the Trans-Mississippi Theatre, Thomas has taken command of a small force and he begins to move down the uh, Mississippi River, taking control of Osceo. Uh, which will facilitate the movement of Union supplies down the Mississippi towards Memphis, basically. What this means is that whilst this remains in Union control, uh, Union forces can, uh, yeah, send their SPs from St. Louis, from Illinois, even Ohio, to Memphis, where Grant can, uh, well, from there they can be railed, and Grant can more easily pick them up to facilitate his, his campaign. Now, this is where, I mean, Lee has sort of, this momentum, he strikes at Banks. He doesn't just sit in Fredericksburg, he's taken this large army, he leaves one garrison behind, uh, and he moves north. He hits Banks again, and he forces Banks to retreat to uh, Washington, uh, demoralized. So Lee, again, double blow here to the, the Union. They're even more divided now. Banks has taken some heavy losses. He's in Washington. Um, there is a fort in Washington, but it's only, I think it's only a level one fort, giving a plus two modifier, and Hooker is now a long way away. Now, there is this small force under Sedgwick. I think there's only one or two SPs there. It's not very big. So Lee has the initiative, and he's looking pretty strong here. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Confederates spend some SPs. There's one out in the Western Theatre. Kirby Smith decides to avoid, uh, to abandon his kind of position in Bowling Green. He's kind of surrounded by McClellan, uh, Rosecrans, and Sherman, and he decides to give up Bowling Green. Uh, he can't really sustain supplies here for much longer, so he decides to get out of there, and he moves to Clarksville, Tennessee, crossing the border where he can sustain supplies more easily. Meanwhile, Van Dorn, seeing what Thomas is doing on the Mississippi, decides to try to shift out. Remember I said Van Dorn was sort of in this critical position where he could move anywhere in Missouri? He decides to try to inter interrupt the flow of these Union supplies down the Mississippi River. So he begins to move to the east. In the second action cycle, uh, Union has an initiative and they move quickly to reinforce Washington. And you can see Harpers Ferry has a small fort, Stoneman with a cavalry unit, Hooker way down to the south with Hunter. Uh, at this point, the Union are just hoping that Lee doesn't do too much. Now keep in mind, there's a navigable river uh, dividing Lee from Washington here. So it's very difficult for him to move a large force across. He's limited in what he can move. There are modifiers for this. At this point, it would be a horrific move for Lee to cross straight into Washington. It's not something he wants to do, but it's certainly creating some panic amongst the Union. They're giving up Harpers Ferry. They're giving up the Shenandoah Valley just to reinforce uh, the capital. Now the Trans-Mississippi, though, things are going much better for the Union. Uh, Curtis has captured Fayetteville. He begins to move down uh, 
towards the Arkansas River to move on Little Rock. Now, Little Rock is again a 2VP objective location, so he's going to try to extend. It's hard going out here. He's going to try and extend his supplies through Springfield, through Fayetteville, and then down the Arkansas River to try to support his drive um, yeah, into Arkansas. In the west, Rosecran <laughs> relieved that uh, he didn't have to fight for Bowling Green, that Smith just abandoned. There was no fighting here at all, just this kind of standoff between the two armies. Rosecran captures Bowling Green and then invades Tennessee, moving down those rail lines to support uh, Sherman's capture of, of Nashville. Uh, McClellan, McClellan stays where he is in Hanover. You've got Greason's cavalry unit in Columbus. Uh, even here, Kirby Smith is not in a, a safe position. Over in the east, okay, so Lee facing the Potomac River, facing this Washington garrison, decides to dispatch Jackson. Uh, and Jackson just kind of uh, relocates around to Culpeper. Uh, could have been more aggressive here. Uh, I don't know why he wasn't at the time. He's basically divided Lee's army in two. Lee has half the army. There's about seven SPs here. I think Jackson takes the other seven, and he begins to move to the west to try to undermine Hooker and Hunter's position um, down the south. Meanwhile, whilst Smith is retreating from Bowling Green, Pemberton is moving north to interfere with Grant's supplies. He can't really take on Grant, and Grant has been pretty quiet to this point, in this, in this turn. And Pemberton decides, well, while you're not attacking, we'll disrupt your supplies. Uh, so he begins to move north to try to cut supplies flowing down the, the Mississippi River. Um, actually, sorry, it's not Pemberton. It's um, uh, Forrest. Uh, Thank you, Benjamin Forrest, with a cavalry unit moving north to, to do that job. Uh, but Pemberton's in Corinth still in a safe position. Here we see the, the rest of Jackson's action. He moves to destroy the uh, Stoneman's cavalry unit. Stoneman is uh, removed from the map. And he... Yeah, moves into the north of the Shenandoah, capturing both Strasburg and Harper's Ferry. At this point, Hooker and Hunter still have supplies which they draw from West Virginia, um, but it's going to be, it's, it's a fragile supply line. It's so easy for the Confederates to cut that supply line because these, basically their supplies are drawn through Northern Virginia. It's very easy for the Confederates to cut, uh, recapture those supply areas. So if Hooker and Hunter were to push to the east, they would be at greater risk of having their supplies cut, it'd be much easier for Lee, Jackson, Bragg to um, reconnect the supply line. So this is really disrupting uh, the Union positions. And again, this uh, Union panic is spending a lot of time out here not knowing what to do. Over in the Western Theatre, uh, it's a pretty small move. Holmes just withdraws from Granada. He's got a small army, can't fight Grant, decides that it's better for him to link up with Buckner and uh, consolidate a larger force to confront Grant if he should move to the to the south. And Van Dorn changes his mind again with Curtis moving around towards Little Rock. Van Dorn decides not to confront Curtis, but again to look to disrupt his supply line. So he moves to the west and his plan here is to try to strike at Curtis's supply lines, try to disrupt his supply depots um, that will be facilitating his drive on the rock. It's almost like he knows what Curtis has planned and he's going to try to disrupt those plans. The Union responds by moving Stanley. Stanley's kind of just shadowing Van Dorn. He moves uh, into Arkansas, uh, doesn't really want to fight. This is basically cavalry unit versus cavalry unit. It's a bit of a lucky dip as to who will survive. Uh, so Stanley's just kind of shadowing Van Dorn and trying to stop him causing tr too much trouble. Meanwhile, uh, McPherson, uh, finally, again, this is another standoff that has been in Kentucky for some time. McPherson decides to move on Gardner. He's long outnumbered him. He's got a two to one odds ratio. Finally decides to attack him, uh, forces Gardner to retreat uh, to, through the Cumberland Gap uh, and yeah, back to the south. Uh, so finally, we're seeing some Union activity in, uh, in this area, the Western, Western Theatre. Uh, this is sort of out eastern Tennessee. Uh, he chases because he has more than two to one odds, and he attacks Gardner again and forces the elimination of that uh, that Confederate force, and Gardner is isolated and, and removed. 
And this opens up an, uh, a new opportunity for uh, the Union out in eastern Tennessee. With the Cumberland Gap captured, there are no Confederate forces in this whole area. And so he's got sort of paths wide open. He can head towards Knoxville, Chattanooga, or east uh, towards Whiteville and uh, sort of towards Virginia, basically. Um, and there'll be more developments here in the coming turns. Over in the Eastern Theatre, okay, Hooker finally decides to do something. Uh, he takes the remnants of his force and moves north. Uh, he attacks Jackson, uh, displaces, defeats Jackson and pushes him out of Harper's Ferry, recaptures Harper's Ferry, uh, which was a lucky battle. I think this was very close, but Hooker had to do something. So yeah, this was... Very lucky that it fell in the Union favour. Jackson retreats to the northwest. Union recapture Harper's Ferry, and kind of this is a much better position. Um, they have a, they have a rail line from Harper's Ferry direct to their capital, direct to reinforcements, direct to that other large army in, in Washington. And what's happened here is basically Jackson is now uh, separated from from Lee. In the fourth and last action cycle, the Union have the initiative three to one. And we see uh, with Rosecrans sort of tying down Kirby in Clarksville, Sherman decides, all right, you can do that job. You hold him there, hold his quite large army in Clarksville. I'm going on a bit of a ride. So Sherman decides to march southeast of Nashville um, towards sort of Chattanooga. Um, and he's looking to extend basically Union control of the rail line. Um, with Because from Bowling Green, the rail line kind of loops around away from Clarksville. And this means that Union can get supplies, they can get SPs directly from the northern states, railed down towards where Sherman is sitting, right there, just outside Chattanooga. Um, yeah, so that's that's the objective here of Sherman's move, to try to facilitate I guess, rapid movement of supplies into, uh, into Tennessee. Meanwhile, over in the east, uh, Confederates respond. I think there's a couple of moves going on here. Uh, Bragg, Bragg moves to the north to take up Lee's position just south of the Potomac. Meanwhile, Lee moves to attack Hooker at Harper's Ferry. Unfortunately, I mean, Lee doesn't have the big army that he had previously. Uh, he throws a special card at the combat, but he loses and is demoralized in the process. So Hooker has done really well here to uh, disrupt this Confederate offensive. Yes, the Confederates have seized the rest of Northern Virginia, uh, and they did a lot of damage in these, those two battles from earlier. But now Hooker, pretty much single-handedly, has defeated Jackson and defeated Lee in battles around Harper's Ferry. And the Union, the Confederate forces now, after these losses, uh, are much reduced and no longer a, a direct threat to, to Washington. So I think this was an opportunity for the Confederates. They, they had this moment here where they could have crossed the Potomac, captured northern cities, uh, but thanks to Hooker, and good fortune, they uh, they stopped those plans in their tracks. Okay, so heading into summer 1863, um, after all after all his great work, I remember after all of Hooker's great work saving the Union, he is demoted and replaced with uh, <laughs> Meade, a three-star general over in the east. It's just amazing how <laughs> this, the timing of all these promotions and demotions and replacements uh, all work. So here's an overview of the situation. Meade taking control in the east. Uh, Sherman and Grant kind of behind Confederate forces in Tennessee. Um, but they're, they're this very fragile. I'll point it out. It's a very fragile supply situation. Um, and yeah, that's that's it's the driving theme of their Western theatre campaign. So on this turn, first action cycle, Union had initiative with three um, action points. Uh, Hooker uh, demoted uh, picks up some SPs in Washington and moves them out to the west to try to confront Yule, who has yeah split from Lee's force and he's um, just disrupting things here. This is sort of standoff in the Eastern Theatre. So Hooker goes to try to take on Yule. Meanwhile, in the Western Theatre, McPherson crossed the Cumberland Gap, moves into Knoxville, and now moves onto Chattanooga, captures it quite easily. Sherman, again, extending that, uh, that rail support line to the south. Uh, I can't recall exactly what his plans were. 
here I think he was trying to get into range of Talladega and Dicatera at the same time just to undermine Kirby's position up in the north. Um, with Grant in Holly Springs, you can see Grant out on the left of this image, Sherman kind of in the center. These two can kind of link up around Dicatera and, yeah, threaten all of all of the Confederate forces in, in Tennessee. So in response to these moves, Confederates uh, decide to pull back from the north. Uh, they pull away from the Potomac. Uh, Stuart's cavalry tries to disrupt Hunter's and Pleasanton's supply in the south of the Shenandoah. They're cutting off their supply depots, basically. Whilst in the Western Theatre, uh, Buckner moves. He's consolidated. He's, he's into a larger army now, and he begins to move, to, move towards Decatur to basically try to stop Sherman uh, and his campaign in the Western Theatre. In the next action cycle, Confederates have the initiative, and uh, Stuart, happy that he has disrupted Union supply, decides to launch another invasion of, of West Virginia. These never seem to go very well. It's hard for cavalry units to do much, but he certainly is going to try to threaten uh, Union VPs at least. So he begins to move towards Grafton. In the Western Theatre, uh, Sherman is worried about that rail supply line, so he, he moves back um, just a little bit further north. Uh, Buckner moves into Decatur. Uh, and uh, yeah, we've got McPherson still there in Chattanooga. Hunter now, this is a bit of back and forth. Hunter decides to try, it's not in the best position to do so because he's so slow, but he figures, well, he needs to rebuild uh, his supply depot line, so he moves again to the west to Warm Springs to control that, to try and get supplies over the Allegheny Mountains into the Shenandoah. Uh, it's a pretty small move. In the third action cycle, the Union Initiative with two actions, uh, and Grant... With Buckner now moving north, Pemberton there, uh, Grant decides to try to move north to reconsolidate, or try to consolidate, I guess, control of Tennessee. It's hard for, it's very fragile, as I said, supply line. Yes, they've got supplies down the, uh, the Mississippi River, but there's this big rail network around Columbus, Clarksville, that they want to try to, or, which Grant, at this point, is trying to consolidate. What he wants to do is be able to rail supplies more easily through into central Tennessee, uh, Mississippi, and so forth. Uh, so he moves north. Uh, in fact, there was, I should point out, there was a Confederate force out in this area. Nathaniel Bedford Forrest has his cavalry unit. So that's what they're doing here. Uh, Forrest was uh, just, again, threatening all their supply networks. So Grant, with uh, Grierson's cavalry unit, decides to cut them off, off wipe them out, and put them out of action for, for a short while. Securing then, well, hoping to set the foundations for secure Union supplies in Western Tennessee. In the Eastern Theatre, uh, Confederate entrenchments, uh, consolidating their positions, just kind of keeping the Union up in the North. In the last action cycle, Confederates have the initiative with three actions. Stuart uh, moves into Cumberland to uh, disrupt Union rail lines. Uh, Ewell again moves south to Staunton to <laughs> disrupt Union supplies and, and regain that resource hex. Uh, and over in the West Theatre, well, because Grant moved to the north, Tennant says, well, I'll, I'll strike while I can, and moves into a virtually unoccupied Memphis to regain four build points. And again, uh, just frustrate the Union efforts in, in Tennessee. Now, as I said before, having the initiative is not always the best thing, especially in the last turn, because it means that you have to have your move and wait for the opponent to respond. And Grant, indeed, is not happy with Pleasant, uh, Pemberton's move, and he moves straight back into uh, Memphis, where he smashes into Pemberton's weaker army, uh, forcing them to retreat with heavy losses. Meanwhile, uh, what's happening right now is, to give you a sense of, sort of context here, the Union are behind schedule. They're behind their benchmark and it's causing some desperate maneuvers so out in south carolina sigil who was kind of sitting outside florence again i regret this move but he decides to uh, move on columbia now it's a couple of victory points which kind of saves the union bacon at this stage because they really need every last victory point they're close to they're very close at this point to being 12 victory points behind the benchmark which is an automatic confederate victory and it's driving these quite desperate maneuvers. So yeah, Sigil takes this small force, ignores Florence, and takes the unoccupied Columbia for a couple of victory points to end out 
platoon. And they very narrowly, very, very narrowly uh, get the job done. I think they end up with 19 victory points. They needed at least 18 to avoid an automatic defeat. So yeah, they just, just eke that out, I think. Okay, so heading into turn 12 now. This is still the, the second summer term of uh, summer turn of 1863. The Union have the initiative with one action point in each theatre. Uh, Curtis again moves to secure his supply lines along the Arkansas River, moves to threaten Little Rock and threaten Morgan's position uh, out here in Arkansas. In the Western Theatre, Grant now deciding he needs to really use his large army uh, to strike, decides to move back down to the south. Uh, he recaptures Holly Springs and then moves on uh, Corinth. In the east, uh, this is Meade attacking uh, Robert E. Lee. So Meade able to consolidate reinforcements quite easily from Washington. Uh, his large army in Harpers Ferry attacks Lee. Lee rolls snake eyes in defense, so fails miserably uh, and is forced to retreat. Beyond just retreating, Lee uh, decides to use his turn to pull right back into Fredericksburg. Uh, more secure supply lines, a, a federate, Confederate fortification there behind the river, uh, and he's been reduced, heavily reduced, by Meade's counterattack here. And so Lee has to sort of uh, just play a bit more conservatively at this stage. Now at this point, again, you've got Bragg's force um, on the Potomac. He has about seven or eight SPs there. Probably a bit larger now. Lee, I think at this point, he's reduced to about five or six SP. So he's got a much reduced force. AP Hill and Ewell, they have only about one or two SPs each. Hindman has one SP. Stewart has one SP. So Confederate forces now are scattered into six much weaker armies. Um, and so they're, yeah, playing it safe. Over in the Trans-Mississippi Theatre, uh, Morgan's cavalry unit, again, indecisive as ever. Um, Curtis did a clever move here. He moved, he consolidated his supply depots along the Arkansas, then he moved to threaten Morgan. Morgan couldn't quite get around that position, so he decides to give up on the idea and move back to the Mississippi to threaten those. Actually, what he's going to try to do is try to move towards St. Louis and threaten those Missouri resource hexes again. He keeps changing his mind. Um, again, Curtis is the the MVP out here in the Western Theatre. He's done a great job, pretty much by himself, um, to contain the Confederates. In the Western Theatre, uh, Kirby Smith dispatches, so with Grant moving towards Corinth, seizing Corinth, uh, almost seizing Corinth, Kirby Smith dispatches uh, Breckenridge with a small force of three SPs to move south to be able to support uh, Corinth and Decatur. He keeps a, a large army still in Clarksville, and this is a small dispatch to... The plan here is to link up with those other Confederate forces uh, in the south and and uh, build what, in effect, will be three decent-sized Confederate four armies in the Western Theatre. In the second action cycle, though, the Union sees you with, with, with a differential of five. I think this is the first five we've seen in the game yet. And Grant decides not to wait for these reinforcements to arrive, but to strike quickly. Grierson moves to cut off the retreat of these forces uh, and he strikes at Corinth, seizing uh, the city and wiping out a large Confederate army. This is very important for uh, the Union. I think it's the first time I've seen a large force uh, being destroyed in, in battle like this. Over in the Eastern Theatre, Meade, because Lee has retreated, it's hard for me to Meade to pursue. He doesn't want to take on Bragg. He's got Stuart behind his lines, just kind of sitting around and threatening him. So he dispatches Hooker into the Shenandoah, or the western half of the Shenandoah, to be in a position with a fairly decent sized force. I think he's got about four SPs here, Hooker, to threaten either Yule or Stuart. It's unlikely he can do much versus Stuart, but certainly he can threaten Yule's position down there in Staunton. And of course, this is the onto Richmond requirement. He must attack somewhere in the east. So that's why he's doing this as well. Uh, so another thing the Union does is back in the Western Theatre, not wanting to wait for those reinforcements to head south and, and link up with Buckner's army. Sherman decides to intercept. He marches west to hit that force and just cause a couple of losses on them. So this also 
cuts off Smith up in Clarksville and is really going to undermine his position up there in the north. In the Confederate turn, the reinforcements finally reach Buckner and they try to form a new base in Decatur. And Kirby Smith decides with the loss of that Confederate army in Corinth, he needs to get the heck out of Tennessee. So he decides to withdraw from Clarksville um, and he looks for a possible escape route out of out of the state, basically. He's trying to rush south as quickly as he can, away from Sherman, away from uh, from Grant. Um, in so this is uh, again, I, I said I regretted Sigil's move. It was desperate in Columbia. Uh, Longstreet and Polk decide to punish him for this silly move, and they uh, surround him, isolate him, and wipe out uh, that that Union army. So, in the one action cycle, we've seen a Confederate army in. Uh, it wasn't Tennessee, it was near Tennessee, wiped out, and then a Union army in South Carolina wiped out as well. In the third action cycle, a differential of one now, Confederate initiative, uh, with a large part of that Union army in South Carolina destroyed, Longstreet decides to consolidate these forces, and he begins to move on Hancock. Uh, now, Hancock does have, I think there are trenches here, uh, but there are now, Confederates have spent some time building up, and they have at least... Six, seven, or eight SPs, uh, thirty to forty thousand troops in South Carolina, ready to kick the Union out. Meanwhile, in the Trans Mississippi, Curtis finally strikes at Little Rock, and he he succeeds. He kicks Gardner out of uh, the area and secures two VPs for the Union. The Union campaign in the West continues. Uh, I think this is Rosecrans capturing Clarksville and then moving south through Tennessee. Uh, building on that momentum. Uh, so now you can start to see, in this image here, the uh, the extension of those Union rail lines from Bowling Green, Kentucky, further north to the northern states, down through to where Sherman is. That's all uh, SPs can travel through all, throughout all that area. Uh, and I think also, at this point, the Union have control of all the, the resource sexes in, in Tennessee, uh, including Chattanooga, Knoxville out in the east, uh, yeah, so quite a lot there. Okay, so uh, the Union out in the east, their SP, their action point is spent uh, to move Hooker uh, south against uh, Yule. It's uh, a bit of a bloody combat. Both sides roll six, but Hooker is successful and manages to uh, eliminate Hook, uh, Yule's relatively small force. I think Yule only had one SP in this battle. Uh, but that's another victory point for the Union to capture, recapturing Staunton uh, yet again. And heading into the fourth and final action cycle, Confederate initiative again, which again is not necessarily a good thing on this fourth action cycle, differential three. Uh, Bragg decides to withdraw from Alexandria. Uh, so he moves down towards, uh, yeah, towards the south to occupy the position occupied by A.P. Hill. Um, and what we see here is just a reconsolidation of Confederate forces. I think he leaves some troops behind with Lee in Fredericksburg. AP Hill had some forces there. Um, yeah, and they're trying to. <laughs> their, their offensive of 1862 is over, and they're reconsolidating in sort of central Virginia. Over in the Western Theater, uh, Smith and Wheeler uh, go on the offensive. Smith. Uh, with Sherman having moved into central Tennessee, Grant out in the west, Smith leaves Buckner behind and moves out to the east to uh, recapture Chattanooga, and Wheeler begins to move to Knoxville. Uh, what this does is it cuts off McPherson from supply and undermine. Well, there's four VPs out here, Chattanooga and Knoxville, uh, and yeah, so McPherson has a decent army here. I think he has six SP. He was moving on Atlanta, He'll suddenly have to turn around. I'll show you that in just a moment. So in the Union response, McPherson moves back north, recaptures Chattanooga. Uh, he's still in a bit of a desperate position here because he's, I think at this point, he has to forage for supplies. He's not in, he's out of supply in effect. Very close to supplies, but uh, just out of it. Uh, meanwhile, out in the far west, uh, what we see here is just the Union forces gaining control of supply depots out around Memphis to try to facilitate smoother supplies. What you can do now here is uh, there should be, because Thomas was in Osceola, there should be a, a supply flag in Osceola. Uh, Union supplies can 
run down the Mississippi to Memphis. Here they can unload and rail all the way out to Grant. Okay, so this is what Grant's been trying to do. Get a solid supply route through to support his operations um, in the Western Theatre. Okay, so heading into fall 1863. First action cycle, Union uh, Initiative. Uh, out in the uh, Trans-Mississippi Theatre, still with about four SPs out of St. Louis, finally decides to move out of, uh, of the city and begins to move south. And again, this is just designed to... It's designed to be the start of his attempt to consolidate Union supply depots on the west side of the Mississippi River. So Seal's plan here is to keep moving south and keep grabbing these Confederate towns to extend the supply depot link, like what Grant has done in, in Western Tennessee. In the Western Theatre, Grant moves on uh, Pemberton in Decatur. Uh, it's a big battle. <laughs> Union rolls quite terribly. Uh, with three dice, but it's just enough to force Pemberton to withdraw. The Union capture Decatur, and again, this is a great uh, moment for their supply networks. Uh, they've really got a great supply chain going now, rail networks throughout Tennessee, um, facilitating, um, again, Grant's efforts to, be, to, to, to continue this campaign. Grant is also a four-star general at this stage, so um, great command capacity. Now, Smith is unsettled by this. He's on the wrong side of the uh, the river, so he decides to move south and again support Pemberton. Uh, and, yeah, they're too close together. They can work closer together at this point. In the, uh, the east, Longstreet strikes at Hancock, forces Hancock to retreat into Fort Sumter, uh, leading us into Action Cycle 2. In Action Cycle 2, Union had the initiative with four... Uh, differential of four. Out in the Trans-Mississippi Theatre, Curtis uh, moves not to attack Arkansas Post yet, but just to be in a position to uh, attack it. In the Western Theatre, Union forces just kind of cleaning up the situation in Tennessee, again, clearing those rail networks um, and consolidating their forces. Now, Grant and Sherman have kind of shifted to the east. They've left behind this kind of scattered... Um, forces. There's a cavalry unit out in Western Tennessee, um, but uh, you've got Brennan here, who is a one-star general. He can command three SPs, but Hardy takes his opportunity. He's returned to the fighting after being sort of eliminated, having his army lost in Tennessee, Eastern Tennessee. He's returned to the fighting, and from Columbus, he moves to the north to, uh, with a relatively small force, he just wants to disrupt Grant's supply network. So he begins to move on Corinth. Um, meanwhile, out in the Eastern Theatre, Taylor also talks, takes a force from uh, South Carolina, and he begins to move, uh, actually, sorry, he builds up in Atlanta, and he's going to move to threaten uh, McPherson's position around, around Knoxville. In South Carolina, Longstreet, still with quite a large army, attacks Hancock in Fort Sumter and wipes him out. So he kicks Union forces out of South Carolina, uh, and gives the Union, the uh, Confederates some breathing space. And Charleston was three victory points as well. So the Union really is desperate now for, uh, for victory points. Here you can see the move that I um, was talking about a moment ago. So this is Polk uh, with the Union kick out of South Carolina. Polk decides to move towards the Cumberland Gap, and he's going to move over the Great Smoky Mountains um, towards East Tennessee. Heading to the next action cycle, uh, we have third action cycle, Union initiative with one... Uh, action in each each theatre. Curtis uh, captured Arkansas Post in the last turn. Now he moves on Camden and quickly captures that. In the Western Theatre, uh, Grant decides to uh, attack Pemberton, and this is a quite a large Confederate force here. Uh, again, the, the Union doesn't roll all that well, but it's enough to defeat the Confederates. Um, he causes some heavy losses, three SPs of losses among that Confederate army, and they are forced to retreat as well. So what Grant is trying to do is just reduce the size of that Confederate opposition um, facing against his campaign. Out in the Eastern Theatre, with a bit of a stalemate around sort of Fredericksburg, uh, Manassas Junction, we see Pleasanton taking his cavalry and quickly marching into Lynchburg. This is just one victory point, but every at this point, the Union is so far behind their benchmark that every point will count. There aren't any Confederate forces out here in sort of this area of Virginia. I don't want to say West Virginia, but Western part of 
the, the, the revised state of Virginia that, uh, yeah, Pleasanton can quickly grab that and hold on to it um, for the VP. Um, in response, okay, so <laughs> Pleasanton takes one cavalry and in response, Bragg decides, well, we'll again take advantage of this opportunity and he uh, decides to uh, counterattack on Hunter in Staunton. He succeeds, kicks Hunter out, and recaptures a Confederate VP. So it's, uh, yeah, a bit of tit for tat out here in the Eastern Theatre. Meanwhile, uh, Hardy marches into Corinth quite easily, again, cutting Grant's supply lines. So this is the story of this Western Theatre campaign. Grant does all this hard work to build these supply lines, and it just takes a, a fast moving Hardy with a small army to cut it off and deny these VPs. Again, this is Corinthians, I think, just one victory point. But again, every point counts. And this is a supply disruption for Grant. He can still draw supplies through central Tennessee, but it's also vulnerable. Um, and it's just frustrating for Grant. So heading into the fourth and final action cycle, Confederates win the initiative again. This is something they don't want to do. Uh, they entrench in Atlanta in the Eastern Theatre, Bragg then moves from Staunton south towards Pleasanton and Lynchburg. I think Pleasanton managed to avoid this battle and Bragg recaptured Lynchburg. Whilst uh, elsewhere, Polk uh, begins his move across the Great Smoky Mountains. And again, this will threaten that Union supply out at Knoxville. Now, the Union is really desperate here. So again, this is another desperate move. From Grant's position, he dispatches Hooker and Sherman. This is two actions. Uh, Hooker captures Tuscaloosa, Sherman captures Columbus. There's only, I think, two VPs here, but they are really desperate. Uh, so, yeah, two VPs captured. Meanwhile, out in the West, Curta captures another VP in the Trans Mississippi Theatre. Now, Price attempted to intercept here but failed, and I think, I think the Union needed this VP to avoid an automatic defeat. This puts a lot of these guys out of supply and foraging, but again, it's it's kind of desperate moves by the union who really need really need these vps uh things are getting yeah really difficult for them okay so heading into 1864 again winter turn no reinforcements confederates win the initiative on the first turn one point differential and out in the trans mississippi theater um whilst uh, curtis done great work captured camden then moved south to shreveport He's, he's in his desperation to move south quickly and through Arkansas and try to capture these these victory locations, he's he's left his supply lines really vulnerable. So the Confederates counter with Price on one star general just moving north to recapture Camden. It's one victory point back, and this cuts off Curtis from his supplies, and it's really quite devastating, as you'll see in just a moment. In the, uh, the Western Theatre, uh, Smith decides to... Uh, try to, again, punish the Union for their desperate moves, and he uh, attacks and recaptures Tuscaloosa out from Talladega. In the east, uh, Johnson moves out of Lynchburg, and he's trying try to chase, uh, I think it's Greg. Greg has just taken command of the cavalry unit, and he's managing, managing to avoid battle throughout Virginia um, as Johnson tries to chase him around the state. Nonetheless, again, they have recaptured Lynchburg, and they're kicking the Union out of this area. The Union respond by trying to uh, recapture uh, Staunton out in the east. I think this succeeds for Hunter. Meanwhile, again, with, with a couple of SPs out in the Western Theatre, McPherson with a large army uh, attacks and recaptures Corinth. Doesn't, the die files go badly for both, but uh, I think McPherson has a large army and larger modifiers, so he recaptures that. Now, Curtis tries to move to recapture Camden, but this battle goes horrifically for him. Um, it becomes demoralised, and in just a moment, uh, he loses his entire army because of uh, attrition. So it's the first army that we've seen wiped out because of because of attrition. In the second action phase, Union Initiative, two SPs, a lot of action in the Western Theatre. Grant um, collects the rest of that army from Decatur, then moves south. Uh, meanwhile, McPherson takes his army from Corinth and also begins to move south towards Columbus, and that's Sherman's army in Columbus. This is also um, facilitating the supply depot link, so Sherman can regain his supplies in Columbus, and it's threatening Smith's hold of Tuscaloosa. Uh, 
in response, Tuss- uh, Smith sees these three, really two large armies approaching, Grant's army and McPherson's army. I think Sherman only has a handful of SPs, but he decides that Tuscaloosa can't be defended. Or, more the point, he'll be easily surrounded here, so he decides to withdraw to Selma and uh, entrench in Selma. You can see Pleasanton there, just out, Pemberton, sorry, out in uh, the west. Meanwhile, Pope continues his move across the Great Smoky Mountains. There's you know, Confederate supply over here, so he just needs to move into Knoxville and recapture it. Um, in the next, next action cycle, the Union has an issue, but it's only one action point per theatre. Over in the, the Trans-Mississippi Theatre, uh, Stanley, again, there's not much happening out here. Stanley tries to chase down Morgan's cavalry unit. The, the cavalry haven't done a lot out here. There's a lot of open ground. He tries to chase him around. Morgan just continues to evade. Um, the Union tries to move to defend Knoxville, but low movement rate generals throughout this Western Theatre has really cursed them. And I've put the generals in the wrong position as well. Uh, I should have had a fast-moving general out here to be able to move into Knoxville, but they can't quite make it in time. Over in the east, Meade, after sitting around the Shenandoah for some time, finally decides to move out. He move in, moves into Culpeper, uh, and I think he entrenches... No, he doesn't quite entrench yet because he's got such low movement rates. So he's trying to kind of get in position to attack the, uh, the Confederates. Over in the Trans-Mississippi Theatre, Price, who has recaptured Ken, now decides, well, Curtis isn't here anymore. Uh, There aren't many. I think there's only one other. There's a a cavalry unit, and there may be somebody up near St. Louis. So Price decides he's going to try to move further north and recapture some of these uh, these lost uh, resource uh, hexes. Polk having successfully crossed the Great Smoky Mountains the rough way, moves into Knoxville, recapturing two... Uh, resource points for build points for the Confederates and denying the Union two victory points. Um, Blunt intercepts though, and so there's a battle which Polk wins. Uh, so they've successfully recaptured Knoxville. Over in the east, Stuart again just a constant thorn in the side of the the Union. He moves back, he crosses over some uh, the Shenandoah Mountains, and then crosses back over again and recaptures Strasbourg in the north. Um, again, denying the Union one victory point. So every time sort of the Union begin to move, Meade crosses the, Shenan- the Blue Ridge Mountains, Stuart cuts his supply lines behind him. It's really frustrating for the, the Union. They needed to have more solid supply lines. Um, again, so this is Price moving on Little Rock, two VPs. He successfully he won that battle, regained two more VPs for uh, the Confederates. And Stuart then again moves further to the west to cut off all these Union supplies coming from West Virginia. Um, Again, undermining Hunter's position in particular, making their position very vulnerable. Uh, I think at this point, Hunter is close to being out of supply. I think he may be out of supply in this position with following uh, Stuart's move here. Stanley again in the Trans-Mississippi, not a lot to do. He tries to chase down Morgan again. And I think he actually forces battle and loses that battle. And so wipes himself out. Meanwhile, in the West, Grant is getting desperate. Uh, he picks up his large army and he moves to attack Smith in Selma. This is an important battle. I think Selma might be worth one, but there's a lot of victory points in this area. Grant tries to attack and he loses the battle. It's the first big battle that Grant has lost. It's the final action cycle of the turn. At the end of the turn, the Union has lost a lot of VPs through these sort of Confederate counterattacks in all theatres. They're sitting on 21 VPs. I think they needed uh, about 36 at the end of this turn, so they're way behind. They're at least 12 behind this, which means it's an automatic Confederate victory. Uh, so you can see Confederate build points back up to 78. So they're on 22, 22 Union victory points. 78 Confederate build points, um, and yeah, an automatic Confederate victory in the winter of 1864. So folks, I hope you've enjoyed this report. This is, of course, my first playthrough of the full campaign. A lot of, a lot of uh, tactical errors. Um, I'm mindful that I made a few mistakes early on, so I've, oh, just a couple of supply issues where I thought I had supply and I didn't. By 1863, I was thought I was playing, for the most part, pretty correctly. Occasionally, still... 
Uh, the hardest part is drawing limited supply through supply depots. So be mindful of that. Uh, this is certainly not a foolproof, uh, absolutely perfect gameplay. I made some, some yeah, rules mistakes along the way. Um, but certainly it was a great loading experience and I'm keen to, to run through this game. It's a wonderful game experience. A lot of back and forth and tension and uh, yeah, great game experience. Hope you've enjoyed it.